All right. Welcome to the Celtics Lab podcast. I'm your host, Cameron tuft I'm joined by Alex Goldberg and Dr. Justin Quinn. We are celebrating Festivus. This is our second annual Festivus episode where we will air our grievances. And to do that, we're going to welcome in Sam Jam Packard of the Anything is Potable podcast over on The Athletic. But that is in the second half of the program and the lab portion of the programming. Instead, uh, we're going to do the news first. And um, it's going to sound a lot like grievances, actually, because the Celtics have lost five of six, including uh, a game that I will try to defend. But let's be honest, a pretty bad game against the Pacers and um, pretty bad games against Magic. Um, Alex, Justin, happy holidays. How are you? I warned you about Aaron E. Smith. (laughs) You put that juju out there. You did. Yeah. Um, doing all right. Just got back from Vermont. Lovely, snowy vacation, chilling in a cabin. Uh, Burlington is very nice this time of year, but uh, I'm enjoying that. Happy to be back and uh, not so happy with the Celtics, but, you know, we'll uh, we'll figure that out. Yeah, I'm moving uh, as I was last podcast. Still not done. Probably won't be done until after Christmas entirely. And that is more fun than watching the Celtics. Um. I want to apologize to listeners. If you hear any yips or moans or barks, that's uh, everyone's friend, Ricky Bobby, who's patiently sitting here podcasting with us. Um, But he he doesn't get to talk, so he's a little lonely about that. So he might chime in uh, out of turn. Anyways, let's get to the games. Um, And most recently, that Indiana game. uh, Again, that puts the Celtics at four and six in the month of December. They've lost five of six. Um, the Indiana game's tough for me to really bury because Indiana shot 8 of 11 uh, from 3 in the first quarter. And so they took a 42 to 22 lead after the first period. And it's like, well, that's kind of hard to deal with. Um, a little bit better defense would have been nice, but 8 out of 11 is like an extraordinary outcome, even if you're playing good defense. So I don't know. They have been without. Horford, they've been without Smart, they've been without Tatum. It's hard to like find a tread line for these uh, six games, other than it's been more losing than winning. Uh, where are you guys at with those most recent games, Indiana or the whole streak? Yeah, I mean, it's disappointing. You know, I think a lot of us, after seeing the Celtics um, charge out at the beginning of the season when they looked like clearly the best team in the world, Um, they, they, you know, I I think some regression was to be expected for sure. And that regression has certainly hit. Um, I think it's less that the Celtics have lost these games and more how they have lost them, um, where the play has been pretty like lethargic and kind of disengaged at times. And admittedly, I, I watched, I didn't watch the Pacers game in real time. I did watch some highlights and it looked like the second half went a little better. So maybe that spark is starting to come back. I also think part of this is just that the lineups and roster have been in a little bit of overhaul lately uh, with the re-inclusion of Rob Williams, Al Horford missing a couple of games due to the birth of its child, Marcus Smart being out for a few games. I, I think there's been a lot of roster turnover in this losing streak. So I'm not horribly concerned from like a process standpoint. Um, it's more just that this team doesn't have as many answers when they are as, you know, kind of shorthanded as we maybe thought they did at the beginning of the season, where it seemed like no matter who was missing time or games, they were just always finding a way to win. Lately, the execution hasn't been up to snuff. Um, I'm fairly confident that they will adjust and ultimately be fine, especially as their roster becomes more consistent on a night to night basis. But um, I do think that, you know, some of the bench guys that were playing just out of their minds to start the season have cooled off a little bit. And what it kind of suggests to me is that kind of going forward, at least up until and through the all-star break, if the Celtics are going to get back to being the kind of world beaters that they were at the beginning of the season, it's probably going to have to come on the backs of their stars, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, more so than it is on the role players who I think are good when they are at their best. But uh, as the recent six game streak have shown that that can't be every night. 
I think that is it in a nutshell, really, is just execution is the real issue here. They're not playing the way that they were playing. They're not diving into the teeth of a defense. They're not kicking it out. They're not moving the ball. They're not getting easy buckets. They're not using transition, uh, turning, turning defense into offense in transition. Like all the stuff that was making them so successful and making the bench so successful and really setting the tone, setting the example and creating the kind of communication they need to be the team that they were has just not been happening. And and some of it I do think is the the roster turnover isn't exactly the right word I want to use, but like the the roster flux, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's been painful to watch, but it is eminently correctable, and we know that it is, which makes it all the worse. Yeah, I it's just I mean Jason Tatum said last night they're not having a lot of fun. It's more complicated than that. Um, but there is like a I don't know. I, we spent all of last season being like, other people are saying that the Celtics are sour grapes and that's not fair. There is something about how they fall out of rhythm that feels off, like that there's a stink that like things should be going better. It doesn't help that the shots just like are definitely just not falling. Um, they're still getting the same looks and Dark White and Brett Williams in particular can't seem to find their stroke. Um, because J.C. Davis has still been playing pretty good, although he sometimes disappears. Jalen Brown's been playing pretty good, although same complaint, maybe a few more assists and some uh, more ball control. But the role players aren't hitting their shots, and like, not last night, but the NBA is usually, usually a game of thin margins, and um, I think that that's probably a problem too. So Alex, to your point, is it worrisome? Like, uh, in terms of like a long-term trend, I'm not sure. Um, is it not fun as a fan and someone watching the game yeah they're kind of losing in like the worst possible way um although orlando and indiana a tremendously exciting teams b i'm willing to be wrong about this but it might be the case that they are not good bad teams they might be bad good teams as in i think they're right. in the, they're in the upper tier of teams that would be good they're just on the lower end of that tier um Dude, I think the Pacers are just flat out good. I mean, I think Tyrese Halliburton is a deserving all-star this year. And the Pacers yeah. have assembled a roster that plays hard, makes a lot of sense, and is coached by Rick Carlisle, who is still one of the best in the game. The Magic, I think, was a little it was a little more concerning to me, the Magic losses than the Pacers loss. Um, I think with the Magic losses, obviously one of them, you know, no Jason Tatum is pretty significant. Um, that given that he's been their best player for some time now, but um, I think the the issue with the Magic loss is that they really did get overwhelmed by the Magic's physicality and size, yeah. um, and that is something where, you know, I think the Magic are a little better than people give them credit for, and you know, it's the NBA with the NBA being the way it is, you truly can lose to anybody on any given night. Like, there's just too much talent in the league to not take your opponent seriously, and I think part of that was the Celtics not taking the magic as seriously as they should have. But the bigger issue to me is that they kind of got pushed around by the magic and the magic are not going to make the playoffs in all likelihood. They're not going to be like a serious threat going forward. But if the Orlando magic are pushing you around, like what's going to happen when you're running into the bucks or to the heat in the second round, something like that. That's kind of the bigger concern to me is that, in, during the winning streak, the Celtics were blitzing opponents with this world-class offense that was so strong that uh, in some ways opponent physicality really didn't become much of a factor in these games. But in the Warriors loss and in the both of the Magic losses, I thought um, the Celtics physicality was really tested and they did not come through on that front. And I think they're going to need to show a little bit more force uh, in some of these games if they really want to be the team that they think they can be. Yeah, I, I I want to talk about that in a little bit, um, but because you kind of previewed the, the box um, before we get an ad break, just briefly, um, the Celtics will play the Timberwolves tomorrow night. Hopefully people are listening to this before that. Um, then they'll play the Bucks. Uh, then they will play Houston, the Clippers, and the, ba -ba 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 -ba, the Denver Nuggets. Um, so a pretty tough stretch of games uh are we feeling amped up about the challenge or a little weak in the knees about the next string of games all of which are at home it should be noted i think they're going to play better against better teams because i think alex is absolutely right that 
the length, okay, so there's an archetype of either style of play or players on the roster or combined where like aggressive defense and long players have been kind of like the Achilles heel of this team so far this season. And I don't know. I think that if they're actually expecting to be working really, really hard for a win from the, from the get go, then they will set the tone properly and come out and at least like, I don't want, there's a, there's some concern, rightfully so, that Christmas Day is going to suck, uh, at least for Celtics fans. I'm not so sure about that because I think they're going to rise to the challenge. I think they're going to come out right, and I think they might actually have the opposite effect on the Bucks, who are, are going to expect a team in disarray that they aren't going to find. The Bucks are a little bit a team in disarray. I mean, not as much as Boston, but um, they they look a little vulnerable. But I, I suspect you're right about that, Alex. Uh, your thoughts on the upcoming stretch? It's definitely a tough stretch, but I think all of those games are winnable. Um, you know, the Celtics beat the Denver Nuggets pretty handily uh, earlier this year. You know, the Timberwolves, I think, are a team that is dangerous in the right circumstances. Anthony Edwards is an extremely dangerous player, and, you know, he's always going to be a threat. And, you know, Townsend Gobert, if they play, I think will both be challenges for the Celtics front court. Um, but those are both games that they realistically can and probably should win. Uh, no disrespect to the Nuggets and Nikola Jokic, uh, who is playing once again like an MVP candidate. Um, the Bucks game, I think, will be physically a challenge, but I, I do have a sense that like Jason Tatum tends to kind of rise to the occasion on national TV games. So I fully expect that one to be a battle. I'm not sure who's going to win, but I think it's going to be a legitimately close game. Um, I think it's a tough stretch, but I also think it's a good chance for the Celtics to get right against some high quality opponents and show that, you know, a kind of mid December slump is not something to be particularly uh, worried about. And, you know, mid December slumps happen for championship quality teams. The NBA season is incredibly long. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to like lose sleep over this stretch. Um, they, they were always going to regress. Um, I do think that we want to see progress from here. That's the big thing is just like start to get back to the brand of basketball that made this team look so dominant at the very beginning. If we see the process and the kind of quality of play improved regardless of the win loss record over that next couple of games, I think I will be happy. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of boos and that was against the Pacers. Um, and I just can envision headlines and radio bits about the Celtics if the next few games go south. Um, okay, a little bit of news, and then we want to talk about the history of Christmas and the Celtics. How lovely. Uh, Rob is back. That is certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, I I'll go first and say that I don't think it's fair to expect him to play more than 20 or so minutes a game right now, but the 20 or so minutes a game he is playing is looking really good. Uh, T and Brogdon are figuring out their chemistry. He's a little lost on defense at times, but uh, I mean, in the games that he's back, he's dunking so ferociously, he's catching lobs. It's really a sight to build. So I am consciously playing a long game and I encourage other people to, but the early returns are great. Justin. Yeah. I don't really think you can criticize his return at all. If anyone is looking confused about his return to the court, it's everyone else and how to integrate him more so than he, uh, he's doing a good job of even, even when he makes a mistake, he's been doing a pretty good job of recovering and, and contributing to some winning basketball when he's on the court. Um, I can think of a couple of plays from the Indiana game uh, in particular, but more than anything, I think that the 20 minute per game limit that is on him now uh, is my, might not rise too much more. It might rise to like 26, 28 minutes per game. I don't know if we're ever going to see Rob playing 30, 33, 35, 38, even more on a couple of occasions last season ever again. And uh, probably like maybe not in his career. Yeah. Alex. I think that, and I think that's fine, actually. You know, I think that the big thing for this team is starting to prepare for like, what is Rob going to be like in the playoffs? Like, what is his availability going to be like? What are the rotations he's going to be in? Like, who is he going to be out on the floor with in the playoffs? And 
keeping Rob capped at that level of minutes, I think, is pretty realistic ultimately for what his playoff contribution is going to be. It might bump up a little bit depending on his health, but that's just something that we haven't been able to rely on ever. So um, I would expect that, you know, as Rob kind of continues to get integrated, those things will sort themselves out a little bit. The thing that I think is kind of missing for the Celtics team that deafens Rob's impact a little bit is that one of the things that Rob was really excellent at last year was being on the floor and uh, amping up Marcus Smart's game. And Marcus Smart has not been on the floor for Rob to do that. So the kind of backbone of the Celtics defense last year, a lot of people thought Rob Williams should be, you know, in the DPOI conversation. And I think deservedly so a lot of people, you know, Marcus Smart ultimately ended up winning DPOI, but the secret sauce of the Celtics defense last year was both of those guys plus Al Horford on the floor at the same time. That is what really took the Celtics into a stratospheric defensive team. And they just haven't had all three of those guys on the floor very much in these past six games. So I want to see what the team looks like when you have Horford, Smart, Rob Williams, and Jason Tatum, who I think is making a nice little like all defense case for himself as well. If you get all four of those guys on the floor at the same time defensively, that's, I think, a closer approximation to what this team should look like coming in April, May, June, et cetera. So we'll see. I hope that June isn't just an add-on, but is in fact an imperative. Um, all right. Uh, we, I want to make people aware that Justin was down in Mexico City because he lives there. Uh, the Spurs and the Heat visited, and he got to catch up with Romeo Langford uh, and Celtics legend Max Struess. Um, and there's a whole bunch of content over on Celtics Wire. So if you're a visual learner or you just can't wait until we talk about this on the next episode of the podcast, which is coming soon, uh, go over to Celtics Wire and check that out. But for now... We are teasing that probably Boston's fine. Probably it's uh, no big deal, but it's worth considering, especially now that December 15th has come and gone, that maybe the Celtics need to make a move. And if it's a minor move, they do have a few small TPEs to play with. Um, Justin, you want to talk us through that? And then you have a list of guys um, that maybe you want to shout out one or two. I will just point out that I know that you, you don't have them here, but you like PJ Washington. Yeah, I do like PG Washington. I think it's just going to be too expensive to be realistic. He has the I, whatever five thirty eight Raptors and Wars and all the stats are worth. He has the worst Raptor in the league. Um, maybe he so, won't be so expensive. Maybe he won't be so expensive. Okay, um, will you talk us through the TPEs and um, maybe tease a few of the names on your list? Yeah, so there's very first of all, let me just say that unless things go very very bad and then everything's on the table, uh, knock on wood that that is not going to happen uh that any moves that we are likely to see are going to be very small they're not going to be bigger than absorbing someone into one of those tpes or maybe the injured player exception that they got from the uh donald gallinari uh injury uh they're not going to trade donald gallinari again unless things are going absolutely terribly uh it's just considering how well they have been playing up until very recently it's just not very realistic for that to happen so just to keep things pretty brief if we were to see the celtics go for a trade it would probably be for a guy who's in the range of a minimum deal uh, all the guys i found that i think are reasonable candidates that could actually help the celtics are who are on teams where they could let go of these players they make less two million dollars or less uh javante green jamichael green kenrick williams thomas bryant nick richards i think all of those guys are the kind of guys that could provide a little bit of something that the celtics don't have right now well enough where it's actually realistically possible they could make a move like this but i don't see anything bigger than that realistically i suspect you're right about that i am i really like rooting for luke Cornette and blake griffin i really think the celtics need another meaningfully playable big. Uh, Just a little bit to, better, yeah. Yeah, what, what I was going to say before is um, Missoula is using Al Horford in that free safety kind of way. He's just like asking Al Horford to pick up like all of the defensive pieces when he's the lone big out there. And it's just not a thing that Al Horford can always rise, an occasion he can always rise to or should even, given his you know age and whatnot. Um, so having another playable big, um, some of the ones you mentioned, it might tickle my fancy, but um, 
uh, just going back to the raw conversation and like possible trade conversations to come, I am ready to open up the trade machine and find the Celtics a, another big because Grant Williams is like a just a large wing at this point. Um, Alex, briefly, not that you necessarily have a list in front of you, but big trade, little trade, uh, no trade for the Celtics to come. Um, I would be pretty surprised if the Celtics make a big trade at this point. I don't see a whole lot of dudes that are available that would just like fit their salary space um, and kind of would be available like that, that the teams would look, be looking to get rid of. Um, I, when it comes to trades uh, for you know contenders, the teams that I always look to are the teams that are trying to get into the Victor Wembanyama sweepstakes, or you know trying to just like shed parts for the sake of shedding parts, basically. Um, and uh, there's no team that I think is doing so more aggressively or will be doing so more aggressively than the Detroit Pistons, who are currently tied for the lead in the Wimby race, but um, could still plan to go even further if for some reason isaiah stewart is able to shake loose oh, that, God guy yes. would, God that guy would that guy would be <laughs> just not gonna a happen but yeah an old piece for the celtics team uh, i don't think it will happen but boy would it be fun to have a big mean athletic meathead center like isaiah stewart to just come in and set monster screens and be a problem and i believe he is still on his rookie contract so that could be a pretty valuable piece they probably have to give up a first First round pick for him oh for sure just to get in the conversation but if the pistons are serious about going all out for victor Wembanyama, uh isaiah stewart is not going to be getting minutes on that team anyway so why well, he, he's been starting lately because he fits pretty well next to jalen duran he's been shooting he's developed a three-pointer for those of you who have not been following the pistons and it's not super accurate but it's accurate enough to be able to stay on the floor with him which is a monstrous front line like good lord I, I, again, yeah, I, I think it's very unlikely that they would actually trade him in the first place. This is purely in an instance where, like, they are so committed to the tank that they are willing to basically um, go all in on picks and future development, and potentially, you know, with that, with if Wembenyama is the guy, and you, it's impossible to play this because, like, they don't know what they're getting even with their record. But you know, if you're trying to open up center minutes, somebody's going to have to get somebody's going to have to lose those center minutes. Nothing says tanking like starting Luke Cornett for three months. <laughs> um, I bet Women Young is going to love Detroit, the Paris of America. Um, let's talk about Christmas. The Celtics are 15 and 20 uh, on Christmas Day games, uh, historically. And the last time they played was last year at Milwaukee. And this year they played at home against Milwaukee. Um, we kind of teased our thoughts on the game, but, uh, we wanted to just talk about the history of the Celtics playing in on Christmas. Um, again, they've played a lot of the games. They've been doing this since the forties and the Celtics have played 35 of them. Um, so not bad. Uh, Justin, can you give us a little bit of a history lesson and then maybe Alex and I will pepper in some of our favorite memories that we have of Celtics on Christmas? Well, it took them a long time to win one. Uh, I believe yeah. they played their first one in 1948, and they did not win their first one until 1954. So lots of Christmas misery. But then again, the early history of the Celtics was filled with a lot of misery, at least until a one Bill Russell showed up with another uh, Tommy Heinsohn. So that's not that crazy. Uh, more recently, it's become kind of an institution for the Celtics. The Celtics almost every year have had a Christmas uh, day game in recent times. So... This is a continuation of that. Uh, hopefully it goes better uh, than it has in the early days. Uh, we kind of already touched on that a little bit, but we'll talk about that in, at length tomorrow on the next edition of the Celtics Lab, this being a holiday special. Yeah, um, some factoids that are kind of interesting. The Celtics playing the Knicks is the second most frequent Christmas matchup. And even though the Celtics don't often win on Christmas, they're five and three against the Knicks. Um, the most frequent... And I never would have guessed this. The most frequent matchup on Christmas is Knicks uh, versus 76ers. I have a trivia question for you guys. There are two NBA teams who have never played on Christmas. Can you guess who they are? Thunder? Uh, no, because we're going to include those. Oh, well, they played in 2018. They played in 2018. Yeah. Um, no, there's 6 and 14 with the Sonics. They, I guess they've been... Yeah, the, the Thunder teams, I think, played a few times. So, no. 
That is to say, no, that's not one of the correct answers. Uh, I'm going to go... I, I would have a very hard time believing that the Charlotte Hornets have played on Christmas. <laughs> that would be one of the teams, yes. And the other team is the Memphis Grizzlies. They have oh, played on that Christmas. needs to be changed immediately. <laughs> well, Alex, they play the Golden State Warriors this Christmas, so that will change. Yeah. Um, so there's a fun trivia question for fans. Uh, yeah, the Celtics haven't historically done great on Christmas, but there have been a few uh, big-time performances. Um, Larry Bird took it to the Knicks 28, 20, and 8 in 1980. Not bad. Bob Cousy went for 35 for old heads back in 1954. Um, my more recent most from, uh, was 20. So the lockout made it to so the 2012 season tech started in Christmas. Yeah. And Rondo, I believe it was like 30. And I, I a better version of me would have looked this up. I think he was like 30 and nine or something like just like a national TV Rondo game. Um, back when it was fun. It was like 17 Rondo. rebounds, which is not something that he was known for. Oh, that was that some, some, Yeah, it was some weird... Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. There was just like that moment in time where the big three were aging and it was like Rondo is the dog, but like the politics of it are both great and confusing. Um, when it popped, it popped. And uh, I think there were multiple... I think the next year Rondo uh, also played pretty big against the Heat on Christmas in those nice uniforms. Um so certainly those were my more favorite Christmas memories. Um, I, I admittedly haven't watched the last few Christmas uh, NBA games. So I go to a, uh, a big hockey house for Christmas. Um, so we either watch football or hockey, usually on Christmas. Um, and then I sneak the NBA on my phone. Uh, Alex, any favorite Christmas or otherwise uh, NBA memories? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's a, it's a little bit, uh, different reflecting on it in hindsight, but I can remember that at the time, um, the best Celtics Christmas game I've ever seen was during the uh, very awkward 2018 season. Um, you know, Kyrie Irving is an obnoxious person and very uh, irritating to deal with uh, in an NBA media world generally. But uh, boy, is that dude a good basketball player. And there was no place uh, where that was more apparent than in the Celtics overtime thriller against the Sixers in 2018. Kyrie Irving had 40 points uh, uh, along with, I believe, and I'm just pulling up the stats now. Yeah, he had uh, 40 points, 12 assists, a steal. It, it was just like a masterful performance uh, at kind of one of the, you know, junctures. Uh, no, I'm, I'm wrong on the assist numbers. It was two assists. I don't know why. <laughs> um, still, he did have Good prep work. Good prep work. Yes. He's, he did have 10 rebounds, though, which is pretty impressive and was just generally a completely dominant player in what was a really awesome game against a pretty good six team with Jimmy Butler, Joel B, JJ Redick, all of these dudes. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, that was an awesome game to watch. And uh, my feelings on Kyrie Irving have changed a lot since then. But boy, was that a fun game. For yeah. me, I think the most memorable recent Christmas game for the Celtics actually has to do with Kyrie Irving in a roundabout way because they had replaced him with, as a UConn fan, Kemba Walker, and getting to watch uh, Jalen Brown and Kemba combine for 52 points and beat the ever-living snot out of the Raptors, who are not such a big, scary thing for us anymore, but at the time, we just had a thing about losing to them all the time. Uh, so for me, that was my favorite 2019 Christmas um, last night I had the great thrill of sitting next to Bob Ryan at the Celtics game and we got to talking a little bit more than I would have expected. And he said, you know what? The Panthers provided the most stable, reliable product in the big East in my lifetime. And I said, Bob, I'm going to quote you on that. And Justin, I'm going to quote him on that because, uh, you know, how I feel about UConn being a former Pitt Panther and, uh, the how do you feel about them right now, huh? Huh? <laughs> I guess it's fine now that they're in the whatever the ACC is. Um, Big East, pay attention. Not for not for Pitt fans. We don't have to. But uh, Providence is still pretty good, and that's that's fun for doing yeah, folks. Shout out to Mark. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, on that wonderful diatribe of uh, unwarranted grievance, let's change gears and through the magic of editing. On the other side of a break, we will welcome in. Uh, Sam Jam Packard of the Anything is Potable podcast, and we are going to celebrate Festivus by airing some grievances. So uh, we'll see you on the other side of the break. All right, let's hop into the lab portion of the programming, and that means two things. First, 
Welcome, welcoming in Jam Packard of Everything is Potable. Jam, how are you? I'm good, but I have to correct you. I think you said everything is potable. It's actually anything is potable. All the things are potable, right? Literally anything is potable. And everything, I guess, to be fair, if anything is potable, everything is also potable. And that's like a Shel Silverstein quote or something? I would think so. Yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure that's where that's from. Anyways, what's up? Good to see you. Uh, you're here because tomorrow, uh, we're recording the day before, is Festivus, the day where we air our grievances from the year. Uh, and Celtics have lost five of six. So there are grievances left, right, and center. Um, but we don't necessarily need to talk about that. First, we'll do NBA grievances. Then we will do Celtics gripes and grievances. And then anything else you want to get off your chest, this is the holiday for that. Um, apologies if the dog is still barking. It might just be a thing. Anyways, Jam, you have first bite at the Apple. It's Festivus. Give us a grievance about the NBA. This for the whole year, the whole year of 2022? Yeah, I guess so. I guess the most recent, um, yeah. The first thing that comes to mind, and this is um, deeply personal just to me, so I'm just going to take the opportunity to be selfish right now. That's what this holiday is about. In a post-COVID world, the NBA has instituted a tiered system of media in which they have said there are some media members, you know, like those who work for the Boston globe or the, uh, the athletic, perhaps if you're an actual journalist, you get to go into the locker room and ask players uh, questions before and after the game. They've also determined that lower tier media members, maybe someone who just hosts a podcast, um, you don't get anywhere near the players. And so as someone who's been covering the Celtics for, I think this is my ninth season, I used to take great joy in being able to go into the room. I didn't really want to talk to the stars. There used to be a scrum of people around the stars after the game. That was not my bag. My, my bag was to go to the maybe the Luke Cornets of the world and ask them what they thought or, or talking to some of the side players. I really want to talk to Blake Griffin because he seems like a hilarious guy, but I am less than of a media member. And so my, my biggest grievance right now is I just, I want to be able to go in the locker room again and ask stupid questions that that was my go-to thing. And now the NBA has taken it away from me. Yeah. I want to hop in because I'm also affected by this grievance. So we've talked about this on this podcast before, like Steve Bullpett before they reopened the locker rooms. And I understand where the players are coming from. There was a while ago at this point, Someone tweeted out a naked picture of LeBron. Like there are serious concerns with who was getting into locker rooms, and I don't want to like yada yada that. However, to your point, you and I are dedicated to the cause. We go to the games. We inform the fans. Um, Forbes' best estimate is that each Celtics fan is worth forty five dollars to the franchise. So we're bringing in at least like ninety dollars to the team, right? I'm sure we have between the two <laughs> yeah. of us a couple of fans. Um, so I do think that our value there is important. And to your point, like when the locker rooms were open back in the day, I was able to talk to DeAndre Jordan about the Ninja Turtles. Like you, you just create relationships in a more organic way, less transactional. Um, so I, I do respect where the NBA and the PR are coming from. I know that the team doesn't really have a say in it too much, um, or at least that's PR's official stance. Um, but it's festive. It's let it rip. It stinks. We just sit there waiting for the players to talk. Well, the national guys waltz their way in and get locker room access, and we're putting in hours. We're raising those nine dollars. Uh, I agree, and I gotta go on mute because Ricky Bobby is also vehement about this. Yeah, he's voicing his concerns. All right, uh, Alex, uh, either add to this or open up a new grievance. I'm going to do both uh, in classic fashion. Um, obviously, you know, there's a number of NBA journalists that I think feel the same way as uh, the kind of grievances aired in the previous segment. Um, you know, and I think that applies both to NBA journalists, uh, to podcasters, and even to people who have been uh, blackballed from the NBA, like Sam Sheehan, one of the best uh, reporters in the NBA today. So just wanted to uh, let you know, Sam, we're, we're carrying the torch for you here over at Celtics Lab. Um in addition to that, I think there's another grievance that I want to air, uh, which is that, and you know, this is a classic NBA grievance. This is an NBA grievance that has existed for an eternity and will continue to exist for as long as the NBA is not refereed by automatons who are perfect. Um, but 
I do think that the NBA needs to have a serious look once again at offering ref accountability. And the fact that they have not done that is quite frustrating. In particular, not even thinking about uh, my beloved Boston Celtics, uh, who I will complain about the refs forever, every game for the rest of my life about. Um, But thinking kind of broader league wide issues, like looking at this clip of how, you know, a few weeks ago, John Morant gets ejected for, well, reasons that I can't really explain or understand at all. Some sort of dialogue that he was having with somebody. um, And that was never clearly explained. NBA refs, use your judgment. People who spent money to come to this game paid money to see John Morant. Like that is why they are there at Oklahoma City on you know whatever night it is. They they came to see the superstars. They came to see these guys on the basketball court to play to do amazing things. These games are not about you. Ejecting John Morant in that moment, kind of in the middle of the second quarter, for reasons that seem to make no earthly sense to anybody just robs NBA fans of the experience that they were looking for when they paid for their expensive tickets. These games Al Horford, are never about you. If Al, yeah, Horford Al Horford needs Horford, to punch game. Mo Wagner in the penis, let the man punch him in the penis and then continue playing basketball. That's why if there's anybody who deserves it, it, it's Mo Wagner. Let's be real. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just think refs have this tendency to um, inject themselves and narrativize the game in ways that really make it a worse product overall. If refs make bad calls, refs make bad calls. Like that's going to be part of the game forever. And I'm not expecting any referee to be perfect by any means. What I am expecting is for refs to not make themselves the storyline. That's pretty simple. So are you saying that Tony Brothers uh, being suspended with pay uh, is not being held accountable? I, I would not call that accountability. No, yeah, me neither. <laughs> All right, Justin, your uh, grievance for the NBA. So this is a little bit timely. Uh, the idea that the NBA is punishing teams by taking away a second round draft pick is laughable. They should do something that actually does incentivize other teams to not, you know, screw over other teams, like give the other team who was screwed over the draft pick or something, someone more intelligent and creative than I am, because at this point, it's just like costing somebody a spot in the NBA, which doesn't really seem very fair. So are you advocating to keep the tampering rules in place and be stricter about them, or should we just get rid of tampering? I I mean, we basically have gotten rid of tampering. It's only when it's very, very egregious. And then even in those cases, like the the Brunson situation that I'm kind of alluding to here, uh, not anymore, the the second round pick is like what? Like they sell for like two, three million dollars. It's like if you include that in the cost of like the overall contract, that's really not a very serious punishment. It's theater. I'm looking this up. Doesn't Jalen Brunson's dad work for the Knicks? Yes, it was does. just a family dinner. They were just yeah. discussing, uh, yeah. the, you know, what they were going to make at Thanksgiving. I mean, I guess everyone, people have been hiring a Tentacumbos for half a decade now. Just, just Those are case. players. That's totally fair. It's not the same for reasons. Okay. All right. So uh, don't hire Jalen Brunson's dad is the takeaway here. Um, okay. I, I have like a couple quick hit. Uh, grievances that I'm going to say sharply, but I don't really want to open the can of worms. First of all, Joe Sai, stop tweeting. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but we don't need to dwell on why I think that. Um, another grievance I have is stop calling traveling. It's an entertainment product. Uh, if you're so worried about the offenses being like out of control, and maybe you can come up with something else, but like, my God, it's not the, the course correction that the game needed. Um, and then my final grievance is uh, fans. Um, the other day, uh, Jack Simone, friend of the bot, well wisher, I'm sure, wrote a really nice thing about how Jalen is committing more turnovers, and people freaked out at him. And it's like if media members get in the weeds about you know the specifics of the game, people get pissed. If media members see the forest and they talk about well, what's going to happen in the finals, people get pissed. It's like. Dang, like there's no way to make content that doesn't anger people unless evidently Justin has Larry Bird stories that move is cool. Just lean into making them angry then. Yeah, maybe that's maybe th- that's what this holiday is about. Maybe I should. Maybe my grievance is with my yellow belly. Okay. Uh let's be more specific about Celtics. 
Jim Packard of the All Things Are Possible podcast. You are back on the clock. What is your Celtics specific gripe? It could be about the, the games, like at the TD Garden, it could be about the team, the coach, whatever you got. Um, I think it's a general idea as a Celtics fan. Um, it's something they're um they did last year during the playoff run. Oh, well, first, this just comes to mind. Airing of grievances, game seven in Miami. What the <laughs> hell was that? That was the dumbest series of basketball that has ever existed. If that Jimmy Butler shot went in, I don't think I would be here. That was the most stressed I have been in the longest time and was just, we didn't need to do that. We didn't need to go through just of absolute four minute collapse in game seven and give up what was like an 11 point lead. That was, um, dare I say, poppycock. And uh, I didn't care for it whatsoever. And um, I think on the flip side of that, I also am upset with the Celtics for giving me hope. Uh I was there in the building, game four, the NBA finals. We were up by however many in the fourth quarter. I had hope Mm -hmm. that we were going to win the NBA finals. That was stupid of me to have. I shouldn't have thought that. We started off with this season with like what? Just the best team in basketball, the best offense ever. And now we've lost four of five. I had hoped that we were going to win 60 games. That was stupid. Should I take some of the blame myself for just uh, creating (laughs) these uh, fantasy worlds? Absolutely. But if the Celtics didn't play so well, then I wouldn't have to go to these worlds where I believe that they're going to be the best team in the world. And so I blame the Celtics for playing very good basketball, but not good enough basketball and giving me this hope that they're never going to lose a basketball game ever again. I love that. I also appreciate it because Alex and I would record after finals games, like, I don't know, one in the morning, very quietly while our girlfriend slept. So we had to talk like this about a really emotional game. Yeah. And so I think that it buried a lot of emotion for me. So now you, you're awakening it in me, which is important because yeah, um, we're impartial on this podcast, but let's be frank, that sucked. That sucked so much. Yeah. Uh, are we impartial on this podcast? Not, not very. <laughs> uh, that's not, we pretend we are. That's not, that's not my read of the room. Uh, uh, Jam, anything else? Um. Not really. I feel bad for, I don't know if it's a grievance, but I feel bad for Peyton Pritchard. Like he should just play more. Um, he Ooh, doesn't have a role. Uh, did you watch last night's game? I watched <laughs> it in the background as I was writing a paper. And so he did miss a layup that would have put, cut the game to five. Uh, and then this Pacers immediately had a three. So maybe that's clouding my judgment, but like, I don't know. He seems like a nice chap. Uh, so he and Blake seem like good guys. They shouldn't play many, <laughs> many minutes for the Celtics. Um, all right, uh, Justin, you get to go first from the Celtics Lab Trio. What is your Celtics grievance this festivus? Well, let me back up just a little bit. Um, I do have to complain about a lack of a team here in Mexico City uh, for, for my NBA grievances. I forgot that. Um, I could be boring for a Celtics-specific one and talk about the offense. That's all we are going to be doing for quite some time. I hope not, but I think we are. Uh, mm-hmm. So my big thing... Uh, besides, you know, the, the league pass season ticket holder spotlight thing that they do, which I don't get and don't like, um, is the lack of Tootsie Roll being played in blowouts. Yeah, although the team is uh, one in five since they dashed the Tootsie Roll in Phoenix. Could be the curse okay, maybe we, six, nine boys. maybe we need a new song. All right, fair. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, my Celtics gripe is with Joe Missoula. Um, he seems like he's doing a really good Brad Stevens impression and pre- and post-game interviews, and sometimes it's cheeky and it lands. But but I do wonder if he's being, like, a little too guarded with how he sees and feels about the game, and it might be helpful for him to, like, find his groove a little bit, to lean into that um, a little bit. I, I don't really know if it would be the same for Brad Stevens, because Brad Stevens came in with such little expectations that he could, uh, like, under the auspices of, a, you know, 30 and 52 team, try that stick on your size. Joe Mazzola has a lot of lights on him. And counterintuitively, I feel like he's being so guarded that he's not able to kind of uh, grow into the role, um, which is like a weird armchair psychologist for someone who just like sits and watches them talk most of the time. But it, it took Brad a while to get more comfortable. Like Brad was initially guarded, but I agree with you that I think 
Bazooka Joe take some per- perverse pleasure in like yeah. not revealing answers and like the, he has a real dry sense of humor and is like when he can stonewall the media he's like I've won and hopefully that does part of me is like okay it's it's pretty funny when it does land but smart mm-hmm. is like you don't have to be a dickhead right now like you can just answer my question about what's going like what you saw out there yeah and that's what I mean is like I don't take a we've both been on the receiving end of it and it's cheeky it's funnier when it's not you um I'm not taking umbrage with it personally, I don't think. I think it's more that, like, like Pop kind of has earned it, and even that bit is a little tired. It's more that, like, I don't know, the media knows a thing or two. Uh, owning up to the things that went wrong helps you think through your thoughts. Maybe he does it in a different place, but I'm a little out on that whole pre- and post-game shtick. Um, although when it lands, it's very funny. The, the only royal family I know is Jesus, Mary, and Joseph is the line of the year for anyone in the NBA. Extremely <laughs> funny. Like, like, just fantastic. All right, um, Alex, the Celtics grievance, and then uh, we'll fly through the rest of these because, uh, Jam, I know you get dinner plans. Sure. Um, my Celtics grievance actually has nothing to do with the team, their recent stretch of bad play, any particular players, any of that. Um, these things happen. It's a long season, folks will be fine. Um, I think my biggest grievance with the Celtics is one that I frankly had for a while now, um, which is fellas, the TD garden is a shitty basketball arena. It's just not good. Um, the seats are very cramped. They're kind of poorly arranged. They're not comfortable to sit in. The snacks and drinks are extremely overpriced. The sound quality is terrible. It's a hockey arena. It's not a basketball arena, and they haven't done a good job of making it a basketball arena. Um, The the hockey team does own it. Yeah, that's correct. And Uh, so, but before the game, Lucky waves a pretty big flag. Yeah, it's like so (laughs) big. (laughs) And sometimes there's uh, unnecessary fire. So I don't know what you're complaining about. I mean, fair enough. I guess then my grievance is more so with Wick Grosbeck and Steve Pagliuccia and all of the other Celtics ownership group. Fellas, Wait, it's time I... to get a Celtics arena. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that forever. Okay, wait, uh, 30 second mini game. Where would you put a new Celtics arena in the city of Boston? And since I posed it, I'll go first so you guys can stall. Sure. Um, I think that if you're standing on the Esplanade looking at Cambridge, there's like Google offices and MIT and like so much important stuff happening, but the skyline is really boring. Some sort of interesting new building that would all. I play a lot of city skylines, which is kind of like Sim City for the 21st century. Um, they need something in this Cambridge skyline, and if it turned out to be a basketball stadium instead of like a big fire, like I was hoping for, that would be pretty cool. So move over East Cambridge, that is the new home of the Boston Celtics in my dream universe. Okay, uh, guest of honor, you got a place where you would put the new Celtics stadium? Um. I grew up in Watertown, Massachusetts, so oh, represent. Um, I'm going to have to say where the current Watertown Mall sits. Um, mm, that would just that's improve. a good one. The Watertown Mall stinks. It's never it's been just good. the DMV. It's just the DMV and a Best Buy and a Target, and it's just like they've redone the entire arsenal. I think it's quite nice, but uh, it would improve my living. I don't even live in Watertown anymore. It would just be uh, like, that's a, like a mile from my uh, child at home. I think that'd be fun. And um, they could call it the dream machine. Oh, wow. The dream machine was the only redeeming quality of the, the Watertown mall back in the day that, and they used to have a store. I don't even know if it was a store, but it was just a place where they would pay you like $20 to fill out surveys. I uh, that. Yeah. So the dream machine, the survey factory and the new home of the Boston Celtics all could be in one. So that's my answer. So long as they keep the best buy. Um, Justin, uh, you haven't been in Boston a while, but where would you put it? So I would take, okay, so a little bit of backstory. I went to this hippie college in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, if you guys know Hunter Felt, who also covers the Celtics, he went there as well. And the the architect, I am Pi, uh, he did the pyramids at the Louvre, if you are familiar. He Whoa. wanted the residences uh, for, the, for the college to be out in Sarasota Bay. Uh, like in the water, water. Right? and they that's wouldn't let him it. do it. That's very so, high. In the seaport, literally. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's the most practical place. That uh, instead of uh, you know just destroying neighborhoods like me and Cam wanted to do. 
Well, I have a solution to that, which I think could thread the needle of both not destroying neighborhoods and also um, getting, you know, a little bit more accessible to the audiences that will show up for the Boston Celtics. Um, and my answer is to put it where the Celtics practice facility is and just turn that into the Celtics arena right down in the Alston Brighton area. Uh, my rationale for doing so is that folks, if you want to get Celtics fans to come out and hang out at the Celtics game and then at the silhouette and the model and all of the other bars nearby, um, that's the best place to do it. Celtics fans are roving around the streets in Alston, Brighton area. It would be five minutes from my house, which would also be nice. Um, but can you tell they, Alex is in a band? <laughs> they're, they're, they are pouring into the streets here. I think you would have not only uh, raucous arena vibes, but you would also have raucous pre and post game vibes with all of the people that you were looking for from your Celtics fan community. So take the practice facility, move it to a different place. It can still be nice. It can still be expensive. Turn that practice facility into the Celtics real life, actual arena. Let's make it happen. They're also going to build a new train station there and straighten the mass pike to accommodate that. So the construction for the next decade, there's going to be outrageous. You might as well just, Bye, Let's do it. Why not? All right. Uh, we will do our general grievances to close up shop with you, uh, Mr. Packard. But first, just quickly, last year's grievances, did any of them get better? No, they still play music during games at other NBA arenas. Please don't bring that to the TD Garden. Um, alternate uniforms, City Edition, they were pretty good this year. I mean, that Wizards jersey alone, the pink one. Most of them were good. Most of them were good. Uh, we talked about locker room access last year. Um, Still working on that, I guess. Uh, and then the team has changed a lot. Um, so I think I'll, I'll breeze past those. Um, let's do our general grievances. These can be really about anything. Um, Sam, Jam Packard, what do you got? First thing that came to mind was I just don't like how bad the NFL is in regards to how much attention it gets just like generally online. Um, I used to be like a watch football Sunday, like every single game, red zone, fantasy football. I used to be obsessed with it all. And it just bores me now. I don't, it, and, but like, also I have to be on like a, a YouTube show where we talk about the NFL every Monday <laughs> and Friday. And like it, it happens all the time and I just don't care anymore. And I just don't see why other people don't realize that like, it's just not, that good of a product like there's one or two good games every week it's not constant action it's like just like waiting around for the, like sick that was a nice two yard gain like there's just not it's just not an exciting product and i just don't get why it's like the biggest thing in the world and maybe i'm maybe this is a, just a personal opinion but it's my personal festivist grievance that's a good one i'm actually gonna go next and tack onto that alex sorry don't ever talk to me about your fantasy football team. I don't give a shit. It's pretend. <laughs> don't ever talk to me about your fantasy football team. It's real I, if you're in the semifinals like me. <laughs> what did I just say? <laughs> Anyways, um, my grievance for the year of 2022. What the hell happened with the JFK file release? Uh, just tell us. Yeah. If, if yeah. there is those people either killed JFK or they're dead, tell us. <laughs> It's unbelievable that they <laughs> angle that in front of us and then pull it back. It's such a silly conspiracy. Just tell us. I We're ready. The world is ready to know if something nefarious or something boring happened. Just tell us. That's my grievance for the year. Okay. Alex, what is your festivist grievance uh, in the world? Goodness, there are just so many, Cam. I mean, it, it's hard to count on one hand how many grievances I could pull off here. But, uh, you know, there is one grievance that I think has been kind of lingering in the back of my mind for a while now. Um, Twitter is, is real bad now. Yeah. And <laughs> I think that is probably going to be my grievance of the year. Um, you know, some certain South African apartheid emerald mining billionaires who may or may not remain nameless uh, have purchased Twitter recently for those who aren't aware and really made the app 
extremely bad. Like, not just from a, like, like the discourse is mind numbing, right? The discourse is incredibly irritating. Like, I don't care. Rich people are annoying, blah, 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 whatever. I'm talking on a very, like, practical, functional level. The app is now a worse app. Like yeah. it's worse to read. There's lots of spam bots flying around. I don't, Elon, I don't care how many people have seen my tweet and not interact with it. I really don't. I, that's just a useless feature. What I would love to see is like my feed actually reflecting my interests as opposed to 9 million promoted tweets about cryptocurrency. I would actually prefer to not see those. Please, for the love of God, sell the app. Sell it to anybody else. Like. Maybe Jared Kushner will do a better job. Probably Jared not. Kushner, I don't know. Jared but Kushner would do a better job. I hate to it's, say it. It's but. just a, a complete and utter disaster. Please, for the love of God, sell the app. No, no, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, um, take us home. So I thought I was going to talk about, you know, some like really trivial stuff like inflation being out of control or people not supporting like strikers and unions as much as they should these days. But I'm going to go for like the really serious and important stuff and just gripe about why it is so hard to find a freaking cannoli outside of New England. Because <laughs> they didn't put Italian people outside of New England. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, okay, special shout out to how bad that Avatar movie looks. Um, Sam, hey, Jim do, no Jim Cameron slander on Celtics <laughs> Lab, please. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's an axe we can grind later. Uh, Sam Jam Packard of some of these things are potable. Um, anything is potable. Check it out. It's a funny podcast. It's a great podcast. Um, happy holidays. Happy Festivus. Hopefully that was cathartic. And um, I'll see you soon, but we'd love to have you back sometime soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And um, yeah. you got a bunch of teachers here, so good luck with your exams. Thank you. I need to edit. A da- I have an essay right now, 5,000 word count. I have uh, around 6,500 words. Uh, so uh, I need to cut back a lot. Always. Oh, they always need to cut back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll catch you later, man. Peace.